guys welcome to a bit of a delayed video I should have been a bit more regular in doing my videos but I'm sorry about that I'm also vaping for you today just as a bit of a variety you may have noticed I'm a bit a bit less active and everything online work and getting the kids into school has been my major occupation in recent days but I'm coming back and I want to give you guys something special in order to come back you may have seen obviously the anthologia of the imperium collections i would like to present to you two actual popular stories one of which is somewhat critically acclaimed by the great ian irvine and also by an important hollywood director who i know simply as mr chapman i will not give his name he asked me not to but he gave this shining distinction so i'd like to read this to you it's from anthology as you can see and it's a story called embodied which originally was set as a standalone but i very swiftly discovered could easily be added into the imperium ethos and it did now, it has experienced a bit of change but let me begin this for you so you can enjoy it so it's called embodied and embodiment embodiment adjective when an idea thought or force takes form in manner observable to all who witness it and we will begin at Maidera. Dromium 17th, 2296 EA. Senses wild and disengaged, running blindly through the forest. Leaf mold and Detrius jumping in slow motion plumes around his feet. Flashes of images strangely coloured and disjointed play before his eyes, but nothing enters, nothing stays. He doesn't feel the twigs and branches and snags as they catch on a flesh of arms, legs or face. Hair becomes soiled and tangled, snarls tearing away to become part of the forest. But he seems not to notice. The breathing is heavy and laboured, sweat running through dirt and tree debris, creating tracks on skin. He staggers, but to where he does not know, from where he has not a single notion. He staggers in complete disorientation, face twisted in effort, or pain, or fear, or all three together, leaning weight on bough or fallen tree trunk. Scrabbling at brushes and shrubs, feet trying to find their own path over roots and rocks and fallen assortment. What is before him and what is flashing before his eyes blends and contorts into twisted symphony of chaos. Animals and beasts, real or imagined, flash before his eyes. A bird wings towards his face in strobe-like stop motion, and he raises his arms protectively to avoid the attack. It seeming intent on taking his eyes or leaving, uh, and leaving only the visions, the waking dreams. But it never reaches him. No part of him is rent or torn away. Was it real or has he lost what is left of his mind? As him as a want to, he tries to figure out where he is, where this place is, but he stops partway through the usual mental inventory. Who, where, what, why? And stumbles at the very first fence. Who? Who am I? Where am I? What am I? When am I? What is this thing I am trying to do? Coherent thought was impossible among the chaos of images, sights, sounds and other sensory information which is flooding him. His mind is not aware even of itself, simply working to keep him alive. A tree root catches his foot and he falls heavily. With a crashing of body and snapping, tearing and lashing of vegetation. And he, try, and he lies there for a short moment, looking dazed, but behind his eyes there is no thought, no spark suggesting he check for injury. Moving into an animal crouch, he sniffs the air and casts an eye about before surging to his feet with a guttural roar and pushing forward once again. Ahead of him, gold shafts of light in which dust motes, da dust motes dance like fairy sprites danced, lance through the trees as the sun rises. Birds begin to sing, layer upon layer of individual song, and a squirrel chatters. Dog after dog begins to bark. Far off in the distance, car horns begin their own discordant version of the dawn chorus. So you're telling me everything is part of some kind of... And hands grasp the air as if trying to pull something out of it. Big machine, but so big we can't even see it. The voice, female by its sound, has a frustrated tone to it. A tall, aesthetic man with grey hair and beard, dressed like some kind of ageing hippie, bright ethnic waistcoat, 
broad brimmed hat, a braided bracelet or two, smiles present pleasantly and gestures to a tree stump just across from where he sits, clearly at his ease. Sit. It is more of a request than an order. He takes up his glasses and cleans them with a pale cloth he found in a waistcoat pocket and puts it back again. Now extracting a packet of tobacco and a pack of cigarette papers, he busies himself with rolling while he thinks. Eyes never leaving, lifting from his task, not checking if she's taken his advice or not. Have you ever heard of Gaia theory, Kiara? The woman called Kiara has indeed accepted the man's offer to sit, and she's currently smoothing her long skirt over her knees. She is much younger than the man who has now lit his cigarette and taken a leisurely, leisurely drag up on it before lifting his eyes to consider her. A student or a granddaughter, perhaps. But she has a look... But well, he has a look of a groovy teacher and she of a student. She doesn't speak and simply waits until he catches her eye, then shakes her head, dark waving hair following the motion of her head, dark eyes challenging slightly. Gaia was the primordial goddess, the mother of titans and of us all. I pause to draw on his cigarette again and flick ash from the end, which he catches in his cup hand in his cupped hand. She embodies living she embodies everything living and moving upon the face of Gaia, he sniffs, pulls a piece of tobacco out of his mouth, considers it and drops it to the ground. Mother Earth and all that, the one called Kiara sniffs and tosses her head. You're, being, you're not being serious about believing all that, are you, Martin? Don't go all sapphic on me, please. Martin smiles again. It's a nice grandfatherly kind of smile, one which would have you joining in. Even if you didn't know why the old man was smiling. Think about it, Kiara. As a student of philosophy, and not as a niece humouring your old uncle. He drops a now finished cigarette into the ground and crunches it out crunches it out with his heel, sending his little pile of ash after it. Tell me that it's impossible. And everything. That ash on the ground, my cigarette butt, and my own hand are not in some way connected. Kiara laughs at old Uncle Martin's old, hippie, aging, hippie ways and beliefs, her head thrown back. Like her uncle's smile, Kiara's laugh is infectious, deep and inflected. Maybe it is a family trait. Pain, pain, pain. That's the only conscious feeling sensation whatever that he can feel or have knowledge of. This is simply because of the fact that it dominates every aspect of his world. It flashes readily behind his eyes. He can taste it, feel it. He breathes it and drinks it. It saturates his, him to the very last pore. And it drips off of him, encrusts him in its tight casing. He can hear noises, but they come in such a torrent that he cannot separate them. Some of them are familiar. Part of his fevered mind is sure, but others he cannot identify. Occasionally one sound lifts itself above the others, like a salmon lifting its head above the waterfall before it leaps against the raging water. Fragments of sound. And with these fragments came something akin to memory. Out of the hub hub hubbub comes a sound, a light, and creating a feeling inside which feels good. A light musical sound, like sweet bird song, but seeming to communicate more. In his mind comes a for a snatched handful of seconds a face. The face of someone he knew, but could not connect any thoughts to yet. The feeling though he feels, it has a safe feeling. Someone like the other feelings that sweep through him now. He casts his face around toward the source of this sound and then, through the cacoph cacophony of sense, comes a smell. One which reminds him of something something once again familiar without truly knowing why or even consciously thinking about it he turns towards both sound and smell and totters in the general direction of both martin had opened a flask opened the flask he'd brought along in his old raffia satchel and filling the cup the cap with strong streaming coffee he passes it to kiara who takes it in silent silent thanks Mad as a bag of cats Uncle Martin might be, but his coffee is the best in the world. You're not listening, are you? The old man says as he pours coffee for himself into a metal mug and adds sugar. Consternation and hurt exaggerating their way across his face. You never bloody listen to me these days, he grunts. Kiara just, just smiles and shakes her head. 
Mad as a bag of cats with lay rabies on a sack load of E. She corrects her earlier thought. It's so quiet and calm out there. She chooses a neutral topic. Of course it is. He keeps a grumpy old man act up for a, a while longer. That's what I've been trying to explain to you just now. He inclines his head slightly to the left and cocks that cheeky half smile of his eyes sparkling. Don't don't know why I put up with such ungrateful company. People pay real money for my knowledge and you get it for free, but still you can play and pick holes in it. And you love every bloody moment of it, uh, moment of it you cheeky old bugger. Pulsing and fracturing and making his mind, his head creak with agony, flashes of multicolour light exploded behind his eyes. Muscles ached and he staggered unevenly, throwing an arm out to tree trunks and not seeing even the bushes and snags which caught his feet. Again came that sound, that noise, that beguiling and enthralling sound, the only sensory input which seemed to make any sense. Moving without knowing why, not, be, not even being able to piece together what is known as a thought in order to create a thought, he headed towards it. Uncle Martin laughed that raucous laugh of his and lit another cigarette. You'll never jump outside your scientific frame of reference, will you, Kiara? He wiped tears from his eyes. I am unable to, to accept that every living thing is part of some order, some great plan. She shook her head and drank some of the coffee. Sounds too like religion to me. You know how much I hate religions and all of the mess that they cause in this world. Uncle Martin shook his head and smiled, sharing a moment of silence with his cigarette. He leaned back, saving the taste of it and froze. Martin, what? Breaches and trick. Branches and trailers whipped his face. The sound and smell became all-consuming, drowning out everything else. He'd, he'd have appreciated the peace of mind were he capable. Closer, closer, something drew him on and became more insistent. The images kept flashing before his eyes and, his drew, and drew his body onward. That sound! What in the name of God was that sound? Kiara dropped her, mic, her, her coffee to the ground as she slapped her hands over her ears. Many times she'd read in books the comparison that something sounded like the screaming of a million tortured souls, and she'd always thought it was a, it thought it to be a pathetic simile. Now she heard it and she knew. The screeching sound reminiscent of pure, unadulterated agony tore through the air, and then came the smell, smoke thick and acrid. Then there came the birds, what seemed like thousands and thousands of them, a crowd of screaming, wheeling chaos on wings. They flowed by in an unstoppable wave, a river of screeching, squalling, screaming, beaks, wings and claws. As they panicked past, they tore, they tore and scratched flesh in their terror. Kiara, Kiara felt herself pushed back by the sheer weight of them. It was like a river of birds. They were running, well, flying, away from something, from whatever made that smoke. It could only mean one thing. She looked at Martin and saw on his face what could only be a reflection of her own emotions, incomprehension, fear, almost total terror. His mouth was moving as if he wanted to speak, but it seemed just like her own. His tongue was cleaved to the roof of his mouth, and no sound would come out. He gripped the upper part of her arm with such intensity it almost hurt her. But the pain was distant, faint, like it was someone else's. Because it was then that she saw the sight which she would remember for the rest of her life. It ran towards him, eyes rolled back in its head, in madness and terror, face twisted in tortured agony, jaws wide to the point of snapping, and screaming, screaming, screaming. The sound it made was one, Kiara thought, could come from no living creature's throat. The sound of a tortured soul. It poured and tore at the loose ground, body twisting and jerking, as it continued to run towards the frozen humans. A great stag, tall and regal, an embodiment of Hearn himself, it almost was. His grey antlers were blazing like torches, the hair along his back and mane was it were aflame, his head tossing this way and that, trying to banish the heat. He could not understand his own body was the source of the flames. He cried and screamed and panicked, not understanding, not knowing what to do. Then he saw them, eyes focusing briefly 
enough to light upon them, and the look made Kiara's heart break, almost explode with a sympathetic, sympathetic connection, sympathetic connective empathy she felt communicated in that animal's eyes, the pleading, the pain, the knowledge that death was coming. The fact that it was still alive was as shocking as the sight of it. It stopped, met her eyes one for final time, before its eyes buckled and it fell to the earth. Dropping and twitching, cloven, ho cloven hooves tearing at the ground. The flame still burned for moments before its final thrashes extinguished them. And Kiara smelt the odour of burning flesh, hair and primal pain. She was ashamed when she realised the cooking aroma was making her mouth water. It lay still and died, and the horrible spell was immediately broken. Martin grabbed her arm more insistently this time and tried to drag away. The car! His voice, his voice tore in a dry throat. Kara, we have to run now. But to stag our things, will you forget the chart done, dear girl, and just get yourself out of here? The obscenity sounded an alien in his mouth. She'd never heard him swear before. It's dead, let's move. More gently this time, though he still dragged on her arm. They ran. The light noise immersed him now. He could feel something tugging up upon his skin. It felt unpleasant. At once, his memory threw up images and thoughts. He felt something which was fear and knew. How did he know? What did it mean? To run, to move his feet faster, because this light and smell meant danger. He was in danger. The fl flames were burning all around him, and all he felt was warmth. He wasn't being burnt. He was, he was not in danger. Kiara can't remember when Martin fell with a cry and stopped her dead. She turned and saw it then. The wall of flames which seemed to be consuming everything, drowning out all other things. The fire was the world and it was approaching them much faster than was comfortable. She could feel the hairs on the backs of her arms and hands crisping now. Martin no, sh showed no signs of getting up. His right leg seemed to be bent in a way that legs don't normally bend. And his face was a flushed one. Oh God. She put her hand to her mouth and reached towards, no way, he started to process, protest, and she dragged him by the, by the armpits, almost screaming with the effort of lifting what turned out to be quite a heavy dead weight, and started to drag him. The car park was close now. She could see Martin's battered old Jaguar bobbing in the heated air. They could make it. She saw it. She saw him. It was the second thing she saw today which would stay with her for the rest of her life. This time though it wasn't an image of horror, it was an image of wrongness. Clothes torn and ripped, smeared in dirt and what looked like blood. The expression on his face was so close to the expression, close, close to that expression of beatific blankness she'd seen on the painted visages of goddesses from the old temples of her youth but the eyes. The eyes were the eyes of a madman. She, he strolled, almost ambled out of the flames, casual as Prometheus, and stopped mere steps away from them. His ambivalence more frightening than anything else could have been. He lowered his head slightly, for he was very tall, and seemed to see her for the first time. Another expression fleeted across his face momentarily, and she saw a human, a man in there, but then he was gone. He took what seemed like long moments studying her, seeming to absorb everything about her. She felt her skin grow cold despite the approaching wall of flame and resisted the urge to shiver. She felt he was appraising her, almost, weighing her in some balance and finding her, finding her, finding her what? He looked Martin he looked Martin he looked down at Martin, who was beginning to prop himself up on his elbows. When did she let go of him? Why was he now a few feet away, equally distant to the man in Kiara? And look at the man. She heard the voice then, but could never be sure, even years later, who had actually spoken. 
The man's eyes moved, the man's lips moved, she was certain, but the voice sounded so distant, so soft, almost carried on the wind and not like the voice she had imagined this man would have, a soft contralto. If words were indeed spoken, words she was sure she didn't catch. Words she was certain she could not even understand if she had. Then Martin, throat hoarse and ragged, spoke. But she could not hear those words either over the pounding and thundering heart and head. Over her pounding and thundering heart and head, then, sorry. The wall of flame drew closer. She felt her head spin and eyes burn. Legs go grow boneless. The horizon tilted and the ground seemed to move. As the sky caught fire, the darkness closed in like the deepest night. Anoyer. Detective Michael Campbell was having a bad night. His stomach was sour and that made him irritable, to say the least. It made his head hurt and this, combined with his incooperative digestive processes, made his patience short. He snapped at more than one of his officers working, one of the officers working graveyard shift with him tonight and made the coffee he knew he needed to kill the headache and tie us off, either as an exercise in masochism or impossibility. Muttering to himself, he popped the drawer to his desk open and rooted around for some, anta for the, some, some of the antacids he was sure he had in there, but was also sure would take a while to work. So immersed was he in his search, he did not notice the young sergeant in uniform until she cleared her throat less than subtly. Feeling irascible, he popped a couple of pills into his mouth and drank them down with the last dregs of cold coffee in his mug before looking off. Sergeant Davis is looking for you, sir. The sergeant, young, pretty, red-headed, may be seen before, said. And Campbell realised that this evening was probably going to get even worse. Sergeant Evan Davis stood before, beside de de Detective Campbell, has cl hand, uh, hands clasped behind his back in silence. Both men were watching what was going on in the room behind the two-way glass in front of them. Or rather, not going on. The man inside of the interview room sat kind, calmly, at, sat calmly at the institutional grey table, his hands folded. He appeared to be looking straight at the two police officers, although both of them knew that was impossible. It was unsettling all the same, though. There was a dit there was a distance, excuse me, uh, let me just moisten me mouth. Excuse me. Nice coffee there, by the way. It's better than Detective Campbell's. There was a distance in the man's eyes. Something sailors and fishermen called the thousand yard stare. There was something else, too. Though neither could put their finger on what it was. Came in last night, early this morning, as you see him, Davis said quietly. Hasn't said a word since. I can't even coax an expression out of the guy. The arsonist? Campbell asked. Well, the trooper picked him up less than a mile from the forest fire, covered in soot and a little singed around the edges, but otherwise unburnt. Davis cleared his throat and sighed. Didn't even try to run. But we're sure he was either there or, or did it. Hasn't said a word, though. Want me to try, then, I suppose? Campbell's lack of enthusiasm was obvious enough to cause Davis to smirk. Work the old magic, as it were. If you can't get him to talk, no one can, Mike. The men have been colleagues for f and friends too long for rent to be anything other than a decoration. Campbell sat down at the table and set his ill-advised cup of coffee down with studied deliberateness. He shuffled his papers and put on his, on, on his spectacles so that he could read them. Took a sip of coffee and muttered something to himself. The man across from him didn't even move or make a sound. Strange. He could discomfort almost any subject by ignoring them for long enough. The fire was interesting in one way, more than any other. The sparseness of its detail. Fingerprints had been taken and passed through the computer by Davis, or one of the uniforms. They'd come back with nothing. Nothing strange there. If he had, if he had no record, there'd be no reason to have his prints to be on file. The man carried no ID, had no identifying marks, and had not even resisted arrest when the trooper had picked him up. The report said he'd appeared to not even have seen or heard the arresting officer, but had 
however, gotten into the car of his own accord and sat down, even closing the door behind him. Not usual behaviour for someone picked up near the potential crime scene, innocent of any crime or not. Campbell continued to read and was surprised to hear a sound from where the man sat. It was a deliberate sound, a distracting and considerable one, the sound of a piece of paper tearing. Campbell looked up and saw the man, a, Dame, a Damon Doyle, roll up a piece of paper he'd torn from one of the stacks Campbell now read and proceeded to clean his fingernails with it. He seemed utterly absorbed in his task, but it was a start, so Campbell decided to keep quiet. I have nothing to tell either you or your officers, Detective. The man's voice was strange, his accent undefinable, unidentifiable. He spoke softly and mon almost musically, though. Anything you can tell me would be better than nothing, Campbell replied evenly. My, you are a cynic to say such things, Detective. Has police work really left your expectations so low? Campbell let this one start slide and change gear. Seeing as you're talking, at least. Can I get you anything? Tea, coffee, a soft drink, food? No, thank you. I have no need for such things, I think. He trailed off and appeared to withdraw into himself again. Obviously confused. I... I, I do not know, but I... Yes, I think not. Thank you. Campbell filed this away for later and changed gear. Okay, but we need to talk. He paused for a moment, pretended to look at the papers in front of them. The girl and the old man. They're recovering well in hospital. You stayed around long enough to get them to safety. Long enough to get caught. The man gave a nod, a smile, but said nothing. May I ask your name? Campbell shifted back down. You may detect it, but needlessly, I assure you. A slight, almost evanescent smile. I'm sorry, but I'm not, I'm not even sure that I follow you. Campbell tried hard to keep his patience. That smile irritated him somehow. You are telling me that you don't remember be your name? Or you prefer not to tell me? Neither detective. Another of those smiles. If I ever had a name, I do not remember it now. So you are half right. But I do not think I even had a name for me to forget. Campbell thought this one over, trying to translate it inside of his head. He looked the man in the eyes and tried to hold his gaze, but found that he could not. He felt the oddest sensation when he did it. Like, like he was being sucked into the unknown depths. Something was dreadfully wrong with this man, this seemingly nondescript man of indeterminable age, who had, if the arresting officer's report had anything had any truth to it, tied together. If the sorry, if the arresting officer's report tied together with forensic analysis, had not only started the long, largest fire in the history of this state one which had swallowed both a zoo and numerous homes in a manner of hours, but without so much of a scratch. As is previously noted, noticed, Campbell saw slight scorch marks on the man's clothes, jeans, on the man's clothes, jeans and a pale t-shirt. But considering he supposedly come out from the fire itself, if no witness reports in this file were to be believed, he should be carrying some form of injury or burn. But aside from soot on his face and arms, he seemed untouched by the flames. Explain. Campbell said simply, I don't think I really need one. My purpose does not require it. That same faraway sink some cadence. Your purpose? This could be the way in. So many criminals attribute their crimes to instructions from some god or ghost, or the ghost of a dead relative. What purpose is this exactly? Someone or something told you to start the fire? The man stayed silent for a moment, seeming to absorb Campbell's words and give them due consideration. Something resembling comprehension crossed his face, and then something even stranger happened. He laughed. Not, the sh not a short laugh of derision, not the nervous laugh of someone caught out, not the confused laugh of someone mistakenly accused of a crime. Not that kind of laugh at all. This laugh was the laugh of someone who had just heard the funniest joke ever told. The kind of unself-conscious laugh of a child, having more fun than an adult could ever understand. Tears were streaming down the man's face, and he started to cough hoarsely, before producing a packet of tissues from somewhere to wipe his eyes and blow his nose. 
Thunderdome strike you as fucking, mister, Campbell said once the man regained his composure. From where I'm sitting, you're in a whole world of trouble if you did start that fire. Millions of damage, were, millions worth of damage was done and dozens of homes were lost. What is funny about that? Nothing is funny about that, detective, believe me. I know the damage caused. The man was utterly serious once more. No, sir, it is not the damage which, is amuse, which amuses me so, but you. I amuse you. I amuse you. My friend, messing with police officers, especially considering your situation, is never wise. I would advise you to explain to me precisely what I have done to amuse you quickly and concisely before I walk right out of this room and get them to book you for this fire. Before I somehow amuse you again. Joe Pesci joke. The man held up his hands in conciliation. Though seemed curiously unconcerned by the detective's outburst. Detective, detective, please do not be offended by my perceived insult. I am not entirely familiar with the conventions of your people. I mean no offence, I swear. Campbell, his interest unavoidably piqued, took a swallow of coffee and wished he had not quit smoking last month suddenly. At least the night could not get any worse than this. If you say so, my anonymous friend. Then please explain. The, mass, the man smiled beautifully and cleared his throat softly. Well, detective, it is not you who amuse me directly, but your innocence. An innocence which is so very, very human. Now Campbell was deeply intrigued. Of all the whack balls in all of the precincts in all the world, this one he had to hear. Then he stopped that thought. There was something, dear detective, I did not start that fire. I was that fire. All across the world it began. Internet rumour sites, blogs and sensationalist news stories began sprouting up like mushrooms in a damp log. Conspiracy theories began emerging at first tentatively, then at full throttle. Details were leaked to the press, witnesses spoke out. Police officers allegedly shared their thoughts and fears in blogs anonymously. Across the entire world it began. Disasters, floods, fires, mudslides, avalanches. All such disasters could occur naturally, obviously. But, so the rumours imparted, near each disaster site a man or woman was arrested, questioned, often accused of the crime, only to disappear from all record. This interviewing officers could not answer the questions asked to them by reporters. Yes, they had spoken to the suspect. No, that suspect had not been neither charged nor indicted for causing the disaster. Amsterdam, Netherlands, 15th of Artermesion. A dike diverting the river dam away from the city is breached by a possible explosion. 300 people die in the resulting flood. Hua Huachuachan, New Aztec Republic, Teremion, 22nd. A massive mudslide breaks through levees surrounding the city and overwhelms defensive. Hundreds of homes are buried. Hundreds more are thought dead. Intentional damage to the walls and levees are suspected. Aswan, Egypt, 24th of Sadion. The Great Aswan Dam is breached in a, sim in a seemingly similar fashion. 3,000 souls are lost in the floodwaters. Zurich, Helvetica, 18th of Gamelemio, Gam, Gam, I'm sorry, I can't even speak my own language. The largest avalanche in known history thundered down upon three skiing resorts, killing at least a thousand. Investigators do not rule out the chance that the avalanche may have been started artificially. Twelve Oaks, Navajo Federation, Nicolium, 19th. A gigantic reservoir of underwear, under, underground gas ignites. The fireball envelops the entire town, which collapses into the resulting sinkhole. Someone was spotted near both an abandoned, spotted near both an abandoned mine entrance and apparently leaving the sinkhole itself. The list got longer and larger with each passing day. Same thing each time. Life lost, someone arrested. 
and then the same person vanishes. Terrorists are considered governments lobbied. People were afraid terror was spreading fast. Years previously, there had been, there had been the shock of there had been the shock of domestic terrorism in the Navajo federations and even in quite little, little Britain. And suddenly the world was convinced they were striking again on an unprecedented scale. The governments of the world were somehow covering it all up. More than 200,000 people from one corner of the world to the other. Almost one quarter of a million lives had been lost in less than six months. Something terrible was taking place, and terrorists seemed to be the to be seemed like the obvious choice, except that no terrorist group claimed responsibility or took credit. Conversely, they were curiously silent, even contrite, as confused, even as fearful as everybody else. The rumor mills were right; something terrible was happening, but they were also wrong. It was not terrorists. There was one more thing they did not know it was about to get a whole lot worse embodiment incarnation avatarism humans have spoken about it since they discovered complex ways in which to communicate their religions are full of it anthropomorphic personification they were particularly good at it the four horsemen of the apocalypse war pestilence pestilence and death were very popular in their myths right up until the very end they had gods, saints, demiurges, angels, more symbols than perhaps there were stars in the universe. Yet they still did not truly see it when it finally came to them. Belief, we suppose, is curious like that. It is easy to believe when there is little or no chance of it ever happening. God is fine as long as he never visits one as home and eats all of the homemade brownies. God is a good, it's a great concept. Evil is, far more in, uh, far, is a far more intriguing concept, but still as much a concept, an empty idea, as good is. An empty idea, an umbrella term used to describe actions which were simply incomprehensible to all who observed them from afar. No one understood the evil. It was beyond their ability to comprehend. So, instead of tra trying to understand the evil and eliminate it, instead of trying to understand the good and emulate it, labels were applied and no lessons were learned. News reports abounded day and night. People watched young children in Africa struggling around on staggering around on television, their shrunken bellies swollen, their faces covered in flies. They lacked the energy to swat covered in the flies, they lacked the energy to swat away. Wars in which millions of women and children were brutally slaughtered for prime time viewing. People shook their heads, muttered prayers or mantras, and did nothing. They were shocked. They were dismayed. But once the report stopped, they forgot and did nothing. The next story broke and they acted in the same way, each and every time. Humans, it appeared, were incapable of learning. So. When the disaster started occurring and the avatars began emerging, allowing themselves to be caught and questioned by those in authority, when they tried to warn the human race of the price they must pay should they continue to treat Gaia, treat the earth and Gaia as they did, they did not listen. They were told, they were warned. We tried to make them see, but they did not listen. Humans never listen not even to their own stories. In the end it all comes down to stories, doesn't it? One must simply decide which stories are really worth listening to and which are just stories. Of course, not all of the stories could be true, could they? And thank you. I will share this with you. I've got another one I'd like to share you with as well. But that was embodied. What I think in some ways is probably the best story I have ever written. This is Alan J. Fisher signing off. You have a great rest of your day.